We're considering today 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 61. Whenever I go away on a trip, as I did last weekend, I'm always worried when I leave the house and haunted by the thought, what have I forgotten to pack? And uh, usually I will think of what it is I have forgotten to pack as I'm driving to the airport or at the very latest after I've taken off in the airplane, both of which occasions are too late to go back and get what I need. However, this time uh, I felt very confident about my packing. And as I drove to the airport, I could think of nothing that I had uh, forgotten to pack. As we flew to uh, Minneapolis and then to Sioux uh, Falls, South Dakota, and drove from there to George, Iowa, I could think of nothing, but I had forgotten to pack. And then I was there Friday night and uh, most of Saturday before the first meeting, and I got a lot of things out of my suitcase and found everything that I needed until, until I was dressing for the evening meeting, and I was putting on a suit and a dress shirt, but no tie. I had not packed a single tie, nor had I packed a, a tie clip of any kind. Fortunately, my uh, host was the pastor, and uh, he had some ties, and uh, so I borrowed a tie. Uh, he did not wear tie class, and I hate a, a tie that wobbles back and forth on you, so I availed myself of a large paper clip, putting it behind the tie here so it was not visible, <laughs> attaching it, there's a trick to this, but attaching it to the shirt. And uh, I went to the meeting in his tie, and uh, the next morning I was wearing a different suit, so I had to get a different tie from him. And by the way, his wife passed on the suitability of all these ties to the suit I was wearing, so I, <laughs> I felt comfortable. And after one of the meetings, somebody said to me, that's a nice tie. <laughs> and uh, sheepishly, I said, yes, it is, and it's bad. I forgot to pack my ties. I had to go of Dan's tie. So you can understand why it is that every time I leave home, I always say, what have I left out? What have I failed to pack? And the question I'd like to ask you this afternoon is, what have you left out? I'm not talking about your packing, but about your prayers. What have you left out of your prayers? As you have prayed this week, and I'm presuming that everybody here has prayed, hopefully every single day of the week, can you think of anything you should have prayed for that you did not pray for? And in case you can't think of anything, I'm going to hopefully open your suitcase at this meeting, and maybe I will be able to show you something you should have prayed for this week that you left out of your prayers. The way I'm going to do that is to direct your attention to what Solomon left out of his prayer. What did Solomon leave out of his prayer? I think there's no question about it that the prayer of Solomon, which we have just read, is one of the great and important prayers of the Bible. I think I'm correct in saying that this is the longest recorded prayer in the historical books of the Old Testament, and that probably can be extended to the New Testament. It is probably the longest extended prayer of which we have any record. It was a very important prayer at a very important point in the history of Israel. The temple had just been built, and for the first time since the period in the wilderness, the glory of God had been manifested to Israel, and the glory of God filled the, the temple which Solomon had built. And so Solomon stands up, and first of all, as you will notice in uh, chapter 8, verse 12, he begins by simply telling God that he's built a house for him. And then he turns around and gives to the congregation of Israel what I would call a mini-sermon, or a sermonette. And in this mini-sermon, which extends from verses 14 to 21, the basic theme is God's fulfillment of his promise to David. Notice in verse 15, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth 
and with his hand has fulfilled it. Look down at verse 20. For the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke. And then he says, And I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. Notice, therefore, in this simple introductory uh, sermonette to his prayer, Solomon is emphasizing that God has kept his word, that God has fulfilled his promise. There's hardly a better introduction to prayer than that, to be reminded of what God has done in fulfillment of his word, to be reminded of the things that he has answered from the prayers that we have prayed in the past. As I look around this table, there are not very many people sitting at this table who are not here as a result of somebody's prayer or a number of people's prayer. I'm going to tell a story that I've never told before uh, about Carlos and Marcia. Uh, it's new to them and it's new to the rest of you, too. Years ago, when uh, Carlos and Marcia first began to come to the little mission over there on Hickory and uh, Jeffrey Street, Mrs. Gill said to me one day, she said, I am praying for Carlos and Marcia. I covet that couple for the Lord. And I remember that very distinctly. And it wasn't too long after that that Carlos and Marcia got saved. And here they are today with us, and we're delighted. But that story could be told about just about everybody that is sitting at this table, that God has heard prayer. He's kept promises that he made in his word to those who pray. And therefore, this is a tremendous encouragement to prayer. And this is the introduction that, that Solomon gives to the people before he turns to God and prays. Now, the prayer, as you will notice, begins uh, really in verse 23 and extends all the way down to verse 53 of the chapter that we have read. I want to suggest, moving very quickly through this prayer, that verses 23 to 26 are a kind of introduction to the prayer. And once again, Solomon, in addressing God, returns to the theme of God keeping his promise. And he praises God for keeping the promise he made to David. But notice also, he has a request based on that. Verse 25, Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you have promised your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. You have kept the promise about the temple. Solomon says to God, now keep the promise that you made to David, that there will not fail to David a man to sit on the throne of Israel. But notice something here. He's quoting God's word. You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel, only if your son take heed to their way, that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And he says, and now, O God of Israel, let your word come true. I want to suggest to you that in the course of this prayer, the thing, one of the things that is overlooked by Solomon just a little bit is that little proviso there, only if your sons take heed to their way. Now, the promise that God had made to David about the temple was an unconditional promise, but this is not an unconditional promise. And God says, I will see to it that David has always a man on the throne of Israel, if your children follow me. Now, the body of the prayer, the main body of the prayer, it seems to me, extends from verse 27 to verse, uh, through verse 50. And in verses 27 to 30, I think Solomon is stating the basic theme of this prayer. He recognizes that God is too great a God to be confined to a mere building such as he has built. But the one thing he wants of God is that God will keep his eyes on this temple which he has built and listen to the prayers that are prayed uh, toward this temple or from this temple. And notice verse 30 in particular. And may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Then here in heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Does that strike you as strange? Why did he not say, and when you hear, answer? Instead he says, when you hear, forgive, as if his main concern is that uh, when Israel fails, they may be forgiven. Now following this, in verses 31 to 50, there are seven 
prayer situations, or to use a modern word, there are seven prayer scenarios. And I want you to notice these seven prayer situations with me very quickly. Notice, first of all, that the first four of them presume failure on the part of Israel. Prayer situation number one is verses 31 and 32, and here he says, when anyone sins against his neighbor, now it's individual sinning against individual. If they come before your altar and take an oath before your altar, we would like you to hear that oath, says uh, Solomon, and I would like you to justify the righteous man and condemn the wicked man. So this is individual sin. Notice for the second prayer situation is verses 33 and 34. When your people Israel are defeated <laughs> before an enemy because they have sinned against you, then if they turn back to you and pray, please forgive their sin. Notice verse 34. Then here in heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land. Prayer situation number three. Notice it. When the heavens are shut up <laughs> and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. And then when they pray toward this place and uh, so on, verse 36, and here in heaven, and forgive the sin of your servant, the end of the verse, and give rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. Prayer situation number four, verses 37 to 40. When there is famine <laughs> in the land, or pestilence, blight, or mildew, locusts, or grasshoppers, when their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, and then whatever prayer and supplication is made to you by anyone or by all of your people, verse 39, they are here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and act, and give everyone according to his just deserts. Do you notice something here? The first four prayer situations all presume that Israel will fail, that God will give them troubles, or potential troubles, and Solomon's perspective here can almost be called a negative perspective on the people of Israel. You see what I'm saying? He anticipates failure. Failure in situation one, failure in situation two, failure in three, failure in four. One of the problems that we sometimes have in prayer is that we have low expectations from God because we have low expectations about the people we pray for. Oh, God can't do much with that person. Uh, God won't straighten him or her out. And you know, Solomon was a wise man. Uh, if anybody could live among men and, and discover the basic tendency for sin in man, Solomon was that man. He'd been king long enough to know that, 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 the, that the people he ruled were prone to failure, prone to sin. And so what we find here is that he is focusing on the, the potential for failure that his people have. And there's a validity to that, but too negative. Too negative. Now look at prayer situation number 6, verses 41 to 43. This is the first one where there's no mention of of sin or forgiveness. He says, if a, a foreigner comes to this house, because they've heard of your name, and, and people will hear of your name, and they come to this house and they pray for something, give them what they ask for so that people will know that you are indeed the Lord God, that they will know your name and fear it. Isn't that interesting? The first non-negative situation doesn't even relate to Israel. It relates to foreigners. When the foreigner comes and prays, you know, answer him so that uh, you can be glorified. This is the first time, by the way, that he has really directly addressed the glory of God in this prayer. Prayer situation number six is found in verses 44 to 45. And here, too, we don't have anything negative. When your people go out to battle, verse in the middle of the verse, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city which you've chosen toward the temple, then here in heaven, their prayer, their supplication, and maintain their cause. This is a prayer for victory, not related to sin. So these two prayer situations are basically positive. But then notice prayer situation number 
7, which is the longest of all. <laughs> Verse 46, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you deliver them to the enemy, and they are taken captive to the land of their enemy, far or near. When they come to themselves, when they repent, when they pray, Verse 48, when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies. Verse 49, then here in heaven. Verse 50, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. And grant them compassion, middle of verse 50, before those who take them captive, so that they may have compassion on them. So <laughs> it's just like, you know, he spent uh, verses 31 to 40 talking about negative things. He briefly touches on a couple of positive things and gets right back into the negative mode. Verses 51 to 53, it seems to me, are a conclusion to the prayer, even though we have a parenthesis here at the beginning of 51, it's just the English translators have put it in. And the best way to read this is, For they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace, that your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant. The reason I want you to listen to the prayers of your people is because they are your people. You brought them out of Egypt. Verse 53. For you separated them from, from among all the peoples of the earth to be your inheritance. So he's telling God, please listen to this prayer because I'm praying for your people whom you have delivered and made your own. What are we to make out of this prayer? I counted the verses in the segment from verse 31 to 50. 15 of these verses were negative, were related in some way to the sin and failure and judgment that uh, Israel might experience. Five of them are positive, and only three of them directly address the issue of the glory of God. Is there anything wrong with anything that uh, Solomon said? I think the answer to that is no. Is there anything left out? I think the answer is yes. There is something significant left out. Fortunately, the writer of the book of Kings does not leave us to guess what is left out, but gives us a conclusion to this passage, which is an eye-opener. So, follow down to verse 54. It says that when Solomon had finished his prayer, he got up from kneeling before the altar. And he turns to face the children of Israel and to directly address them. Notice that in addressing the children of Israel, the first thing he says is, once again, how God has fulfilled his word. So the theme of fulfillment has certainly been prominent here. And then notice what he says in verse 57 and 58. May the Lord our God be with us. As he was with our fathers, May he not leave or, or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. But what is he saying to the people? May the Lord be with us. May he not leave us, but may he incline our heart to walk in his way. You know what I want to say to Solomon? You're addressing the wrong people here. This is something you should have said to God. Nowhere in the prayer does Solomon come right out and say, Lord, we need you to incline our hearts to do your will. Don't turn to it, but let me read you a prayer that is found in Psalm 119. You will see the contrast here. This is addressed to God. The psalmist says, make me walk in the path of your commandment, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimony and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. And then Psalm 141. Again, you don't need to turn to it. Psalm 141. Verse 3 and 4, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. And do not let me eat of their delicacy. 
we are a church who has begun to learn to pray for our children. And we have some very fine turnouts at our parents' prayer meeting in which we're praying for our children. Do you, wouldn't you all who come to these meetings agree that one of the main things we're asking for for our children is God will work in their hearts and find their heart to do their to do his will? But have you ever considered that you need to pray that for yourself? It would be interesting, I'm not going to do it. It would be interesting to have a show of hands around the table. How many of you prayed at the beginning of this day that God would help you to be obedient to him today, to walk in his statue, to incline your heart to do what is pleasing in his sight? You know what we have a tendency to do? Because we feel that we are walking with God. Perhaps we feel that. We should feel that. We feel that as as long as I decide to walk with God, I can walk with God. But folks, that ain't the way it works. That ain't the way it works. We need God to incline our hearts to his way. Or we will wander away from it more easily and more quickly than we imagine. Nowhere in his prayer does Solomon say to God, please incline our hearts to do your will. Instead, what Solomon says is, when we don't do your will, please uh, forgive us when we repent. Why didn't he pray, help us not to wander away from you? Help us not to experience defeat at the hands of our enemy so that we are carried into captivity into foreign lands. Do you realize that the things he didn't ask for are the things that happened to Israel in the rest of this book? And when you get to the end of this book, virtually all of these plagues and problems have happened to them, and the book ends with the nation of Israel going into captivity. How important it was for Solomon and the nation of Israel to say, keep us walking in your way. Incline our hearts to do your will. Give me a heart for you. If we don't pray that, folks, we are making one of the biggest mistakes we can possibly make in our prayer life. We are leaving something out of our prayer that desperately needs to be there. Remember what the songwriter said? Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to leave thee, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The man who wrote this psalm had a, a deep sense of the capacity of his own heart to leave God. And he said, I want you to bind my heart by your goodness. Let your goodness to me be a chain that binds me to yourself. I feel my tendency to walk away from you. Take my heart into your hand and seal it that I reach your presence. How often do we pray something like that? It doesn't matter the exact words in which you put it. But we need this kind of prayer. Now notice something else. In verse 59, Solomon says, And may these words of mine which I have made, with which I have made supplication before the Lord be near the Lord our God day and night, that he may, may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day as each day may require that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. Solomon, you're talking to the wrong people. <laughs> Why didn't Solomon say to God, God, I want this prayer to be close to you day and night, and I want you to maintain the cause of your people 
every day. Maintain our cause every day that the people around us may know that the Lord is God. You've all heard of the American Express card. Don't leave home without it. Let me introduce you to the Prayer Express card. Every day, we need God's help for that day. Every day, we need him to go out into the world with us. Every day, we need his assistance to live acceptably before him and to honor him in the sight of others. The Prayer Express card is the way you charge your needs and weaknesses to the strength and power of God. Don't leave home in the morning without it. Again, do you remember what the songwriter said? I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour, stay, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. The songwriter thought, rightly, that he needed God every hour. And if we need him every hour, we need him every day. And it's strange how many Christians go out into the world on a daily basis and they haven't even uttered a word to God. Or maybe what they've said to God is, you know, just watch over me, watch over the house, watch over the family. But they haven't thought to say, help me to live close to you. Help me to honor you. Help me to walk in your path. Verse 61, the last of our passage today. Let your heart Therefore, be loyal. Now he's addressing the, tro the children of Israel. Let your, your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Well, that's fine. It's good to exhort people to have loyal hearts. But why didn't he say in his prayer, Lord, <laughs> give us a loyal heart. Give, give my people a loyal heart. Solomon is kind of the parent here for the, to go with Renee's uh, message this morning, he's kind of the parent for the nation. And he's saying, look, you folks, they loyal to God. But he doesn't say to God, keep the people loyal. You know what's wrong with a lot of parents? They give 10,000 words of advice and instruction to their kids. Don't do this. Do this. Go to church. Read your Bible, say your prayers, you need God. And when they pray, they say, watch out for my kids. Exhortations are fine, but unsupported by prayer, they are almost always ineffectual. And what we really need to do is, first of all, to pray for ourselves. One of the reasons we don't realize how we need to pray for our children is we don't need to realize how we need to pray for ourselves. But I can't even stay faithful. I, I'm your preacher, folks, one of your preachers, a retiring preacher. <laughs> Younger men will take my place. It doesn't matter whether you're 34 or 64 or 94. You need God. You need him every day. And you need to ask him to help you. There's a song which I, I really like, and we, I've sung it, sung it for years in various meetings and various places. Praise the Savior, ye who know him, who can tell how much we owe him? Gladly let us render to him all we are and have. The, the songwriter in that verse is saying, the, who can tell how much we owe to God? Uh, why, we, we really ought to gladly render all that we have and are to him. But the songwriter did not make the mistake that Solomon made because he does not take it for granted that that's going to be automatic just because that's what he wants. And so in the fourth verse of the same song, he says, Keep us, Lord, O oh, keep us cleaving to thyself and still believing 
till the hour of our receiving promised joy with thee. I don't care how you put this into words in your prayer, but you could personalize a prayer like this, and it would be a very important prayer to pray. Keep me, Lord, open me cleaving to yourself and still believing till the hour of my receiving promised joy with you. Don't leave this out of your prayers. Okay, let's open it up for discussion and questions. 